Good evening. On behalf of the Departments of History and African American and African Studies at Rutgers University, Newark, and our partner, the James Brown African American Room at the Newark Public Library, thank you for joining us for tonight's program, How It Feels to Be Free, a conversation with Ruth Feldstein and Naomi Extra. Tonight's program is being recorded and closed captioning is enabled. So you'll be able to access that by clicking on the CC at the bottom of your bar. If you have any questions at all during tonight's presentation, please enter them in the Q&A box. They will be answered as time allows. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our partner, Reggie Blanding, Rutgers alum and librarian at the North Public Library for introducing tonight's speakers. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, it's my honor to introduce tonight's guests for this program. Uh, first up is Naomi Extra, who is a writer, poet, and doctoral candidate in American Studies at Rutgers University, Newark. Her work explores the agency and pleasures in the lives of Black women and girls. She has been awarded fellowships by organizations such as Crescendo, excuse me, Crescendo Literary, the African American Intellectual History Society, and Cave Canem. Her writing has appeared in magazines such as Glamour, Zora, The Rumpus, and in books like one of my personal favorites, The Breakbeat Poets, Volume Two. Shout out to the Breakbeat Poets. Her poetry manuscript, the awesomely titled Ratchet Supreme was selected by Tiana Clark as winner of the 2019 BOAT, B-O-A-A-T, chat book prize. So please just uh, a hand for Naomi Extra uh, for joining us tonight. Um, and Ruth Feldstein. Ruth Feldstein is a professor of history and American studies at Rutgers University, Newark. Um, before I get into her credentials, she is also one of the reasons for any of my friends tuning in that I will randomly start talking to you about the racial dynamics in the first Rocky movie. <laughs> Just one of many lessons I was blessed to learn in her classroom as a former student. Um, a classroom that has remained influential to my ongoing studies years later. So um, glad I get to tell you <laughs> all this in person. <laughs> um, she's the author of two books, Motherhood in Black and White, Race and Sex in American Liberalism, 1930 to 1965. And the subject of tonight's discussion, the award-winning How It Feels to be Free, Black Women entertain Entertainers and the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, she is also associate producer of an amazing documentary based on said book, which is currently streaming for free on PBS through February 16th. Highly recommend it if you haven't already watched it. Um, that film is directed by Yoruba, I hope I'm not messing this up, Reichen, Reichen and executive produced by an up and coming musician by the name of Alicia Keys. So once again, emojis, clap at home, whatever you do, um, please give it up for Ruth Feldstein and Naomi Extra. Reggie, thank you so much for that um, warm welcome. Um, so I'd, I'd like to start um, by talking a little bit about um, the book, How It Feels to be Free. Some folks may not have read the book yet or seen the documentary. Um, so I was wondering if you could, um, Ruth, to talk a little bit about the book, introduce the book to folks who are sure, tuning in. Sure, and let me just start by saying, you know, thank you, Naomi, for being in this conversation with me. It's just a pleasure and an honor to be collaborating together. And thank you, Reggie, for that incredible introduction and welcome to us. And to the library and to Christina Strasberger of the Rutgers University History and African American Studies Departments for coordinating all of this. And thank you to all of you who are here. Um, so my book, How It Feels to be Free, um, is about six legendary um, black women performers. Lena Horne, 
Nina Simone, Mary McCaba, Abby Lincoln, Diane Carroll, and Cecily Tyson. And it explores the ways that they each help to advance the civil rights and black power movements while also making gender and female power and their own um, um, liberation as women central to those struggles. So I wrote this book because I wanted to shine a spotlight on women whose voices had not really been heard in our histories of civil rights movement. And I think it's kind of counterintuitive or funny to think about incredible vocalists like Lena Horner, or Abby Lincoln as their voices not being heard. But when I say that, I mean that they haven't been heard and haven't been central to how we think about the politics of the movement. And that what I'm arguing is that it's important that we think more broadly about what constitutes politics. And that when we do so, we see how critical these women were to two of the most transformative social movements of the 20th century, civil rights and women's liberation. And I think, you know, most people in these eras weren't necessarily marching. They weren't necessarily participating in boycotts. Um, they weren't involved in battles, even over elected officials. They may not even have been voting, but they listened to music. They went to movies, they turned on their televisions. And when they did those things, they encountered these women and the interventions these women were making in battles for freedom. Yeah, I really love that idea of thinking broadly about um, what constitutes as politics. Um, so these six Black women entertainers that you chose, one of the things that I was really curious about was, um, well, first, well, why these six? But then I'm very curious to know if you had trouble um, choosing if there were others that you were looking at as well that you maybe left out of the book. Yeah, that's a great question. And I feel like everyone has their list of people who should have made it in, you know? Um, what I was looking for, I did have very specific parameters in terms of who I included and who I excluded um, because I was looking, the part of the story of this book is that this is a loosely connected cohort. Um, any one of them deserves a biography of their own and a study of their own. This is emphatically not a group biography. Um, and it is trying to, in fact, move away from the kind of great person story of telling civil rights. Any one of them was great and any one of them you could look at alone as exceptional. But what I'm also really trying to do is show the lines of influence and that no one of them was acting in a vacuum and that all of these women in this moment were doing different kinds of things and engaging culture um, engaging civil rights through their cultural work as performers. So um, Lena Horn stands out from the rest of the group because she was a generation ahead, but she really provided the template for what it meant to be a modern black woman celebrity and entertainer. Um, and the others all came of age professionally as entertainers and politically um, in late fifties, New York City. Um, in um, Harlem, in the village, and they knew a lot of the same people. Um, there were a lot of overlapping connections. Um, and they also all were engaged in some way with some more formal civil rights organizations, some more than others. But so that's what they had in common. And that's what I was looking for. But I've also very specifically wanted um, diversity too. So they're not all American born. Mary McCabe is a South African um, singer. She spent about a decade in the United States and was very influential during that time she was here. Um, they are very popular in different arenas. They're singers, they're movie stars, they're television. Um, you know, so they're engaging in different kinds of popular culture. Their politics are different. The choices they make are different. The risks they take are different. Their successes are different. So I really wanted that diversity too. Um, as far as who didn't make it in, I mean, I'd be curious, you know, who did you miss? Who, who should, who might have been there, who wasn't there? Yes, that's a, that's a really good question. I, you know, I'd have to think about that. Um, yeah, I'd have to I'd have to think a little bit about that. I mean, Ruby D is an obvious one. Lorraine Hansberry, yeah, yeah. Greta, 
Um, those are some of them. I mean, when I turned the manuscript into um, my publisher, um, I was already over the word count of the contract by um, quite a lot of words and had to cut back a lot from what the original manuscript was. So some of it is just, there just wasn't room um, for, for more people too. But yes, I, I love hearing from other people who they think should be included as well. Oh, okay. So there, there are, some people have very strong feelings on that. Everyone has their B list. <laughs> okay. Um, so the book came out in 2013 and then we have the film that was recently released. And so I'm really curious to know how it went from book to right. book. Right, that so when the book eight. came out and it started getting reviews, um, several filmmakers reached out to me expressing interest in um, turning the book into a documentary. Um, and I met with the director, Yoruba Rishin, and um, we spoke extensively and I just really felt that she was the person I wanted to trust this material with. Um, I um, saw her earlier work, other films that she had made. She's an amazing filmmaker. And I felt that she really understood how to tell this story um, that was really attending to the intersections of race and gender and sex and class and could handle the messiness of the story um, um, without kind of flattening it out um, in ways that I didn't want that to happen. And I feel very, very grateful to, um, to Yoruba and to the entire team, to Alicia Keys, um, to, to, to the entire production team um, for the care and respect and thoughtfulness that they brought to this project as it went from book to screen. And so did that start process, that process started like very shortly after the book came out or? Didn't start probably until about 2015, just conversations, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so it was, it really took off, I, I think in, in 2015. Um, and in the world of documentary filmmaking, there are ebbs and flows just in terms of funding and grants. Um, and you know, doing a wave of interviews and filming and then waiting a little bit. So there were ups and downs along the way of the process. Yeah, it, it, it's great to, to see you in the documentary along with you know, many others, some celebrities and also other scholars. Um, and I was also just, you know, for folks watching, um, you know, I have tons of questions for Ruth. Ruth is also my dissertation advisor. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was also wondering like what role you I got to play because I'm, you know, I wonder sometimes like, do, you know, what role does somebody who's written a book have? Right, in right. The documentary would take shape. Again, I would say that, you know, everyone has a different experience. So I don't know if my experience is representative, but I do feel very grateful to the team that I feel that I have been able to engage in the process. Um, and so it, I think that started just with the overall conversations about what shape the documentary would have. Um, like the book, it isn't, it isn't trying to be a biography of six women. It, it doesn't go woman by woman, it's organized and it tells the story more by theme. And I think that was a very um, deliberate choice. And I think, again, a lot of documentaries are so sort of, you know, birth to death, great man story. Um, and that can be a very compelling well, way to tell a story. So I think I was involved in the framing of the story, um, the research, um, the sources that they could draw on, um, who people in the field were, who they should speak to additionally, um, developing questions for interviews, grant writing. So I was involved in different ways with those different components. That's great. I'd like to transition to talking a little bit more about like the content of the documentary. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things that's really special about it, I mean, there are many things, but the, is just the presence of Cicely Tyson um, and also in your book as well, mm -hmm. um, especially because, you know, as everyone must know that Cicely Tyson um, passed recently. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, Cicely Tyson's significance, um, you know, in your book, but also just yeah. more broadly. Well, I just want to start by saying, you know, Cicely Tyson, um, 
was 96. Um, one can't say that someone who lived the life that she lived, that it's a tragedy when someone like that dies, um, but it's very, very sad. Um, she had remained so vital for so long and she had kept on finding new roles, new ways to contribute. And most recently with her just released memoir that just came out a week before she died. So I just wanna say, you know, before anything else that um, I just think the world is really a better place for her having been in it. So let me just start by saying that. Um, in terms of her contributions over many, many decades, um, Cicely Tyson's career first started in the late 50s and early 60s, but from the first, well, from when she was first getting started, she was extremely selective about what parts she would take and what she wouldn't take. And she consistently refused to accept roles that she felt were degrading to black women or that reinforced historically entrenched stereotypes of them as either overly sexualized or overly subordinate. And she did that even when that meant that she didn't work for long stretches. Um, so Tyson was again, you know, active in theater in television, um, in some films from the late 50s on, but she didn't really get the roles that she um, should have and could have until the 70s um, when she soared to international superstardom with this series of roles in which she played um, women from the past, distinctly unglamorous, ordinary women, poor women. Um, and um, you really see this in the movie Sounder um, from um, 1972 in which she plays the part of Rebecca who is a mother and wife of a sharecropping family in Louisiana in the depression. Her husband is um, arrested when he steals a ham to feed his hungry children and she really works to keep the family together um, through these struggles. Um, so with the part of Rebecca and then in the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman and in Roots and in every role that she played, she infused the women she played um, with dignity, with grace, with beauty that had long not been seen. And so she really helped to redefine Black womanhood on stage, on screen, on television. Um, and she really offered a particular vision of Black power and of Black women's power that then circulated again, both nationally and internationally um, on movie and television screens around the world. Um, and she continued to make those contributions well into her 80s and 90s, you know, doing new, new things um, in different roles. And she never stopped growing um, and she never stopped making these contributions. So it's just a tremendous, um, just tremendously significant to, again, um, to so many different culture industries and to the social movements as well. Um, so with that, should we look at a short clip? Should we take a look at a clip from Sounder? Yeah. So folks can see a little bit of the it let Hollywood. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll look at Sandra at the end. We'll we'll come back to that. So let's let's just remember that. Sure. So um I wanna also I so kind of circle back to thinking about um the book and the film. And so you know, when you're you talked, we talked a little bit about um your role. Um, in shaping the documentary. And I was also wondering, um, what are, can you talk a little bit about some of the, like the differences between the book mm -hmm. and the film? That's a great question. Um, thank you for asking that, Naomi. So, um, so there are a lot of differences um, when you take something and go take it from text to screen with visuals and audio. Um, 
So one really, really big difference is that Pam Greer is, plays a big part in the film, in the documentary. And I did not write about Pam Greer at all. And Pam Greer is um, a performer who starred in um, the black exploitation films as they came to be known. Um, and many of them were featured these very macho, masculine, violent heroes. And um, here comes Pam Greer as sort of the female counterpart to that and known as sort of the first black female action hero. Um, so um, the director, the, the team, the film team really felt that it was important to include her in the story. And I had not written about her in the book. And I think it's a great addition. Um, again, it adds a lot of diversity and she's really, really interesting. And well, let's take a look at some Pam Greer. It let Hollywood know that there was an audience for, you know, hot black women that would, you know, spend their money to go in there, sit in the theater and watch them. Why don't we go and uh, adjudicate this matter in chambers, as they say, and maybe we can make a few motions or something. <laughs> we also found out black women are very vindictive, you know, and when revenge is in play, they get revenge, which was awesome. This ain't gonna hurt. <laughs> They also found out that they were professional and able to carry a storyline uh, and were important in terms of how we wanted to perceive ourselves on screen. Get her! Get the other one! Get her! Pam's star was an action female hero. She really owned a spot for women in the 70s with those films that America had really never seen before or since. It was fun. Just go out and jump around, fall off buildings into bags. You know, I love flying, I love scuba diving, I love, you know, being outdoors, I love action. And a lot of women said, oh my God, my daughter is so inspired. Have I bruised your masculinity? You're sexy. It wasn't called black exploitation until a woman walked in the shoes of a man. How to take you? Try me. And a woman whistled at a man's behind in some tight pants. And a woman flirted, and a woman held a gun, and she did what men did. Then it's exploitation, but it wasn't. It was what, from a woman's perspective, liberation. I called it black liberation. So yeah, I think that clip really gives you a sense of how she adds so much to the story. And again, you know, she and Cecily Tyson are both popular at the same time. Um, they couldn't be more different. And in fact, um, Cecily Tyson was quite critical of black exploitation films as a genre. And the documentary addresses that too. And again, getting at the different ways in which black women performers um, uh, carved out new roles for themselves and redefined black womanhood on screen. And it wasn't like there was just this one um, consensus or one monolithic way um, getting at the multiple representations of black women in popular culture by bringing Pam Greer into the story um, alongside Cecily Tyson. Um, so I think that's one big difference from the book. Another big difference, and maybe this is just stating the obvious, is that you know when you're when you're reading, you only have the words, and when you have a documentary, you have the visuals and you have the audio, and there is just something about that that is really, really powerful. And I think the archival footage that they found is just incredible. And I can say, even speaking for myself, um, as someone who did a lot of research for the book. There were excerpts and interviews and clips that I had read the text from, I'd read the transcript, but I had never seen, I had never heard the audio. And it just kind of blew me away to, to have those elements with it as well. And I think there's a clip that we can take a look at um, about Abby Lincoln and the ways, the misogyny that she faced as a jazz singer, as a, as a black woman jazz singer and, and the intersections of the racism and misogyny that she faced that just really come through in a different way. So let's take a look at that. Um, a very influential jazz critic 
for the journal Downbeat lambasted the album and accused Lincoln of being a professional Negro, infusing jazz too much with politics and really deriding her for that reason. Downbeat conducted a roundtable discussion to air the situation. Much of the following conversation revolved around Gitler's review of Abby Lincoln's album, Straight Ahead. It's impossible for me to be a professional Negro because I am a black woman. <laughs> I meant by that using the fact that you were a Negro to exploit a career. On this exploit particular, a career. On this How can I sing as a black woman, as a Negro, if I don't exploit the fact that I'm a Negro? Yes, but I thought you were overdoing it. They attack her in a way that they cannot attack Max Roach. If anybody has a right to exploit the Negro, it's the Negro. I felt she was leaning too much on her Negritude in this album. They attack her in a way that they will not attack a Miles Davis or John Coltrane. Everybody is not black in this society, and the people who are are the only ones who are qualified to say how it feels. And I, Abby Lincoln, sing about what's most important to me. You know, when I was a professional Negro, nobody seemed to mind. I was capitalizing on the fact that I was a Negro, and I looked the way Western people accept you. I was not an artist, I had nothing to say, and as soon as I said, I don't want to do this anymore, they came down on me with all four feet. And you can see her changed appearance in terms of her commitment to representing herself as a certain kind of black woman and defining herself as beautiful on her own terms. The permed hair and perfectly quaffed dues, gone, gone. Afros and braids came. I started to wear my hair. Yeah, so I just think that is an example, um, that, that encounter that she had with the journalist, Ira Gittler, the, the jazz critic um, in Downbeat, um, in a symposium, it was called, um, about racial prejudice in jazz, to hear their voices and to see the photos from it. It just really is different than reading the transcript. And that's just something that a film can offer. And there are many other examples of that. You know, you can try to describe a scene in a film um, or a scene from a television show, but to watch the clip. And again, all of the archival footage is just, is just really wonderful. Um, and I think then third difference uh, in terms of the documentary from um, the book is that the documentary takes us into the present, not in terms of focusing um, at length on what women performers are doing today in their own work, but by talking to women today about the impact these women who I wrote about have had on their lives. So to hear Alicia Keys talk about it, to hear Lena Waithe talk about it, um, among others, um, it really, um, again, it, it makes the history anything but dry and set in the past. It brings the women I write about into our present in really, really meaningful ways. And we can take a look at someone um, in that regard too. So why don't we look at a clip for that as well? Yeah, Cicely Tyson, I mean, obviously she's been a part of some of the most incredible films of all time. But what I remember the most is meeting her and I was immediately drawn to her. That gorgeous skin and this most magnificent queen face and this tiny body, by the way, very small woman and spirit like bam. In 1961, one of Cecily Tyson's first big performances was in a play called The Blacks. Yeah, and I know just for myself personally, you know, hearing Alicia Keys, hearing Halle Berry, hearing Lena Waithe and others talk about what the women I write about has have meant to them personally in their careers and their lives. I just found that personally very moving um, to, just to hear them reflect on that. So I was, I think that was just really wonderful part of the film as well. Yeah, I hope they're they're all reading your book as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and just also just that very visceral response that Alicia Keys has just to 
to seeing Cicely Tyson, just what, and you know, that comes up in the documentary as well, like, you know, her dark skin and um, having representation of dark skinned women in film. Right, right. I think that's a, I think that's a really, really good point and, and a big theme both in the book and in the film. Um, again, coming back to the significance of Tyson and also the significance of Nina Simone too, um, who didn't kind of fit the standards of um, what beauty was supposed to be like um, in sort of white defined standards and what it meant for, um, for black women to have Nina Simone as a model. Um, and also, you know, Halle Berry talks about that with regard to Diane Carroll as a light skinned black woman performer too. Um, and it's also really interesting to hear Lena Waithe talk about the fact that she was named after Lena Horne, which is just so interesting. Um, I certainly didn't know that beforehand. Um, and on the surface, they couldn't be more different as performers, but to see this link across generations really um, is so important because part of the problem I think is that so much of this history has been erased and that each time someone accomplishes something, it's like, oh, they're the first, they're the first. Um, I um, talk about this in the book too, and this is speaking to the issue of beauty and, and hair and things like that. Um, at least four of the women I write about, I found in my research, people at the time talking about them as the first one to wear the hair in an Afro. So each one of them is like, the first and just our desire to like name people as exceptional as the first but the result of that is that the fact that all of them were doing it at the same time gets erased and the fact that there is this cohort of women who are redefining beauty and redefining glamour and rejecting assumptions about what women should look like um and you know, again, when we're when we're just looking for who the first one was, we don't see that. And so, being able to tell the story where you see women making connections across um, generations and decades is really a way to fight back against that erasure and recuperate the history that is so important. I think. Yeah, if I could just add one other thing that I think. Um, happens both in the book and in the documentary that's important is this opportunity um, for these entertainers to express themselves in their own words, like, you know, with Abby Lincoln. And then you get, again, like, you get like Lena Waithe, you get um, Halle Berry talking about their experiences um, as Black women in their own words and just claiming their right to do that. So mm -hmm. it's very powerful to get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was curious too, just you know, just to um, to ask the question you asked of me to you, Naomi. Um, were there people in terms of you know current performers who you would have been interested to hear them reflect on performers from previous generations who weren't in the film? Oh, that's a that is a really good question. Um, I I mean I think I there's there are some you know, contemporary um, like young women, um, black women jazz performers that I thought of like um, Jasmia Horn, who's um, really coming out of the tradition of Abby Lincoln. Um, but it's interesting too, because, you know, I, I kept thinking about how jazz music doesn't have the same place, quite the same place in our culture right now as it did then. So um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's another interesting thing to think about is kind of, what's changed and what's stayed the same. What do you think, Sess? What are some of the things that have changed? <laughs> think, what are some of the things that haven't in, in the world of jazz for black women? Yeah, you know, I was really struck by, and as you mentioned, um, the difference between reading the book and watching the documentary with that clip with um, Abby Lincoln talking, um, responding, to the criticism from Ira Gittler. And I think that, you know, in some ways social media has made, yeah. um, has provided space for black women performers and entertainers to really thrive. But it, in a lot of ways it hasn't changed. And we've seen from last summer, you know, the social justice movements 
um, conversations that happened last summer that so much has stayed the same. And especially thinking about um, when it comes to racism and sexism within jazz music, but all across, um, across the board. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, there's a, it was really interesting to be looking at your book and not even, you know, not because you're my dissertation advisor, um, but to be looking at it over the, over last summer and to be using some of that history to make an argument yeah. for yeah. today. Yeah, I think that's, that's really important. And again, I'd be interested in hearing more what you think about that. But I do think that, you know, I feel like the word unprecedented is used way too much to describe the last year of our lives. Um, so many things are unprecedented, but you know, I do think this past year has, has brought a, a really um, significant um, a moment of racial reckoning in terms of protests. And at the same time, let's remember that in the last year or two has been such a significant moment in terms of Me Too activism. Um, and the ways that Hollywood is reassessing its role and the ways it's perpetuated racist stereotypes. Um, and so I feel like all of that, like our current moment makes it particularly important to look back and to tell these stories of women who struggled in their own periods of time to break these boundaries, um, and each one was a trailblazer, um, even though, you know, I'm also saying that none of them acted alone. Um, and the ways they inspired um, generations of black women performers afterwards too, to continue to push boundaries as we see we continue to need to, to do. Um, and I think in this regard, it's also really interesting to think about Nina Simone, um, because when I first started doing the research on Nina Simone, um, you know, jazz fans knew her, you know, serious scholars of civil rights history knew her, but, but most people had not really heard of her. And plenty of people who did civil rights history, who did women's history, you know, she had really fallen through the cracks because she defied conventional boundaries in, in so many ways. She wasn't a traditional jazz musician. Um, anyway, but, but it has been so interesting over the last, you know, five to 10 years and part two documentaries have come out about her, um, but the ways in which she has been reclaimed as an icon, you know, going to protests now and hearing Nina Simone music playing um, is just really incredible. Um, and the ways in which she has really become so iconic. And, and I say this, you know, it's like, sometimes it's a little, um, you know, it's like, I feel like I can be in Walgreens and hear Nina Simone. It's like, you know, it's almost elevator music. Um, but at the same time, again, you know, I think a new younger generation of activists also have been inspired by her just as activists were in 1963 when they heard Mississippi Goddamn for the first time. Um, so to see that still happening today, I think speaks to the resonance of the women I write about and the resonance of them in this moment, particularly. Yeah, and you know, that really makes me think like, you know, just circling back to your, your comments earlier about presenting these women, not just as like, individual greats, but as maybe part of a cohort, a network, a coterie of black women entertainers. And I think, you know, thinking about Nina Simone, one, you know, we she's become so ubiquitous um, and it's been used in kind of marketing and branding around social justice in a way that it's, that can be problematic. So in what your book and what the documentary does that I think is so productive is to put her within this context so that we can then think about Nina Simone you know, not as just this, you know. Right, and let me just tell a story about that too, because you're right, she has become so ubiquitous um, and almost a brand, you know, uh, um, is that it's easy to forget um, the risks that she took, but also um, how controversial it was, but also still is. So um, again, this is a few years ago before she became, 
as well known as she is now. Um, but my daughter was in, in sixth grade and they were doing, uh, she goes to a public school and they were doing a unit on civil rights activism. And her teacher asked me to come in and talk about music. He knew what I did and to talk about Nina Simone. And I was like, oh yeah, great. You know, and this was, you know, before PowerPoint and before everything. And so I'm like carrying my, my tape and I have like my handouts for them and everything, dating myself here, how long I've been working on this project. Um, and I was planning on playing Mississippi Goddamn to them and, and giving them the lyrics and talking about it and how she came to write it. Um, and the day I was scheduled to go, I got a call from the principal saying, you cannot play Mississippi Goddamn to this group of sixth graders. And the reason he gave was because of the word Goddamn, the profanity in the title, as if any sixth grader had not heard that or worse. And, you know, I, I just really felt strongly and I continue to feel that it was less the goddamn and more that this was not the soundtrack of the civil rights movement that they wanted these public school kids to have. You know, they wanted to hold on to their story that they have at their Martin Luther King Day assemblies where the soundtrack is We Shall Overcome and This Little Light of Mine um, and not a song about rage and injustice um, with lyrics like, you know, you're all gonna die and die like flies. And so, I think it's just important to remember um, that again, even as someone like Nina Simone has become more popular, just to, to remember the, 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 what she brought to this, you know, and she was really issuing challenges and she's still, her music is still issuing challenges. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. That I think that helps us think about Nina Simone and think about, um, Black women entertainer activists in general. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, so I, you know, of course we can, we can go on and for folks who are listening, if you have questions, we're gonna, um, we have a few more things to talk about. Hopefully I have some more questions, but if you have questions, feel free to send them over to us. But let's circle back and show that clip from Sounder too. Yeah, that, I think that would be great. Thinking about Cecily Tyson and yeah, her. let's talk more about that. Taste of that jail. Ready? Let's cut that shirt in, David Lee. When you get out of that school, you come straight on home. Yeah. We got to see them relate to each other in terms of daily struggles. You know what it was to feed your family, what it was to connect romantically, what it was to have a community around you. Two of you could sit under a shady tree, drink ice cold whiskey, and shoot the breeze. Well, I hope you told them I was too busy for that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it was black love. It was beautiful. It was political because we weren't allowed to have that. We weren't given the freedom to actually be full human beings. And Cicely Tyson brought that to us. She was amazing. Her running, just her acting had such breath in it that I think we realized that you could actually blow it out of the water. <laughs> There's something about us that always made us want to close in and it was because of how we had been treated. Cicely was like, let's open it up. Let's break it all open. And this happened in Los Angeles, and this was a journalist who said to me, I'm glad I saw the movie, Cicely, because I never really thought that a black man and woman could relate to each other that way. I thought that the thing that existed between them was just a lust or a sex, that they never really had love. And I said, you know what you're saying? You're saying that we're not human beings. She said, the only way I get my education is through the film media, through books, and through the one or two black people that I meet in business. But I don't really know them, so I don't know their lifestyle. I don't know what their home life is like. Well, in that case, then it's serving as an education to many whites. There's nothing more powerful than being able to speak the truth of what you're living, when it's not easy, by the way, to stand for stuff. 
to stand up in front of all these people telling you that, you know, you shouldn't, you couldn't, you wouldn't. They'll kill you. You won't have a career. You won't feed your family. You know, it is not easy. I'm glad we watched that. You can never get enough Cicely Tyson. <laughs> I just have to say, you know, I really encourage people to watch Sounder. Um, that scene where she's running and she, Rebecca, the fictional Rebecca and Nathan, her, her husband, are reunited when he comes back from jail. I have watched it. I've shown it at talks more times than I can count. And every single time I tear up, every single time. Um, and she's just amazing. And I think hearing her talk about um, what this white viewer said to her really shows us the impact. You know, anytime anybody says, oh, it's just a movie, you know, think about that. Think about um, how transformative that can be in terms of um, how people think about race and gender and, and the lives of Black people. Yeah, it's just so, so tender, that film. Yeah. So yeah. much tenderness there. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm just checking very quickly our chat box here, one moment. Okay, so So I think um, I think we can start to to wrap it up. There are it looks like it looks like there's at least one question that's there. Um, but before we move on to the questions, we're going to say something. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be really nice to kind of end or wrap up this part with just one more clip um, from the documentary um, for folks who haven't seen it yet, and um, hopefully you all will go out and do that. And it speaks to the title as well. And then, yeah, I, I'm, I'm opening the Q&A box and I can definitely, we have time to get to a lot of these questions. So we'll do that right afterwards. Variety of it. I'm continue to fight for it, by the way. Next month on December 19th, <laughs> I'm going to be 94 years old. <laughs> This is the culmination of all those years of have and have not. I knew how it would feel to be free. All of these women knew that they were doing it for those that were coming behind them, that we would be freer than they would be. The kind of strength that these young people have is so fearless that it's so strong and so beautiful. And what we do with that freedom is very important because we need to free up those that come after us as well. Black women artists muster the courage to use their platform to make a difference, and they're really carrying the torch. We are artists. We are activists. We are entrepreneurs. We rise. <laughs> Found out how it feels. I know how it feels to be free. three questions in the q a box mm -hmm, for you yeah um you want me to pose some of them sure okay so the first one and um 
yeah, there's three or four. So we've got 10 minutes. So the first one is how did Ms. Feldstein prepare slash write the book? Mm -hmm. So did you interview any of the subjects alive? Um, did, you, did you talk to Pam Greer or Cicely Tyson or was it all from secondary um, or existing sources? Um, I interviewed some people for the book. I did not interview any of the women themselves. Pam Greer is not in the book at all. Um, and I did not interview Cecily Tyson, um, but I did conduct some interviews. Um, I didn't make that a priority. I used mostly sources from the time period I was writing about. Um, so primary sources, um, and that's in part because what I really wanted to know is what these women meant to people at the time that their careers were ascending, at the time that I was writing about. And I really thought of my research as one big giant eavesdropping session. Um, so that while interviewing people and talking to them about their recollections and, and thinking back on that period would definitely have been fascinating. That wasn't my main question. My main question was really, how did they come to have the significance that they had in the moment that I was writing about? So I relied more on the voices from those periods of time rather than um, voices looking back at that period of time, um, which is not to say that the interviews I did weren't really helpful, but it just wasn't my primary focus for that reason. So many good questions. Mm -hmm. um, so another one is um, there's a small thread in the documentary about um, Black Sorry, here, it's uh -huh. skip down. Um, there's, uh, so there's a small thread in the documentary about black women who are producers and directors. And so this person says, I'm curious about whether a historical documentary in the future might focus on that cohort of black women. And if we can imagine that as politics in any way. Yeah, I think, well, to start with the last, it definitely is politics because um, so much um, of what I'm talking about um, for the women I write about and that women are talking about today is, you know, who controls the stories? Who gets to tell what stories? And um, part of my book too, and part of the documentary too, is that even as people like Lena Horn, you know, was able to insist, she was the first black woman to have a contract with a major Hollywood studio in the 1940s. She's really, breaking new ground in that regard and really a trailblazer in that regard. But at the same time, she can't control how the studios use her at that point. And she has a stipulation in her contract that she won't play maids on screen, which again is a tremendous breakthrough um, to have that included in a contract. She rejects the image of the mammy and says she won't take a role like that. But as a result, the studios don't use her. Um, she is used in movies, she comes on, she sings a song, she's not part of the storyline. And then they, that, that's it for her role in the film. And studios, they did that because Southern theaters didn't wanna see a black woman. They could cut her out of the films that she was in when they showed these films in the South. So, so the women that I write about struggled to control their own representations, but they also ran into walls. And Lena Horn is an example of that. Whereas when women are writers and directors and can really control the means of production and, um, and are telling the stories themselves, that, that goes a very long way. So my hope would be that there will be a future documentary about Shonda Rhimes and Ava DuVernay and Lena Waithe and other black women who are writing and directing and producing today, which I think will be great. Um, the next question is, how do we decide to use the term artist versus entertainer as we discuss these six women? Such an interesting question. Yeah. Um, well, you know, when you're writing, sometimes you just have to use different words somewhat interchangeably, um, just so that you don't keep on using the same word again and again and again in sentence after sentence after sentence. Um, but I think it's very important to think of um, the women I write about as artists. I think entertainers is a way, is a word that sometimes can diminish people, not necessarily. Um, I think they're artists, I think they're intellectuals. You know, they are forging new ideas and, and new meanings and new belief systems. So I think of them as intellectuals, I think of them as activists too. 
So I often refer to them as um, artist activists or sometimes activist entertainers. So, so I think it's a lot, you know, what you do around the word, not just the word itself, but one of the reasons I am sometimes wary of entertainers is that it can be a way to minimize their contributions and minimize them as thinkers and activists, as well as just standing before a camera. Okay, so this question says, um, this person would love to hear you speak about what precedent, if any, the blues queens of the 1920s set for the women that you trace in the book. Yeah, I mean, I think the question of everyone who came before um, the women I write about is a really important one. And there is a long history. And I, I try to tell some of that history in, in very few um, pages in the introduction to the book. But the blues singers from the 20s certainly are an important precedent in terms of the ways in which, again, they are um, claiming their own agency. They're singing from the perspective of poor women, um, ordinary women, they're singing about abuse, they're singing about um, same-sex love, they're, again, trying to control their own storyline through the music. Um, and they're also enormously popular. Um, so definitely they're an important part of the prehistory to my period. Um, um, Black women in Hollywood, like Hattie McDaniel, like Butterfly McQueen, who did, struggle um, with the very limited roles that were available to black women. Um, and it's, you know, very easy to, and valid to criticize the racist representations in a movie like Gone with the Wind, for example. And at the same time, I think it's worth noting that someone like Hattie McDaniel, who played the part of Mammy and won an Oscar for it, I think she's a genius. And I think she infused this role that was designed to present her as subordinate with a certain kind of resistance, um, with a certain kind of power. Um, and she couldn't obviously dismantle this long historically entrenched stereotype of Mammy, but thinking about the um, women in Hollywood who made these kinds of contributions under such constraints is also really important too. Um, and, you know, one could go back into the 19th century, too, for other historical precedents. So there, there are a lot of people who matter before the women I write about came to occupy center stage. Okay, and then, of course, there's, there's some plenty of comments in here as well. I just one response, someone said they didn't hear the, the last person who was mentioned earlier on. So it was, we um, you mentioned Ruby D and Lorraine Hansberry. So mm -hmm. that's just right. right. And I think I mentioned Odetta too. Right. Um, and I'm just scrolling through here. These are wonderful questions. I want to thank everyone for being here. I wish I could see you all. Um, it's a it's an odd format um, to not be able to see, but it's it's just wonderful to engage in the way that we have in an age of COVID. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for contributing and listening and um, being part of this. Yes, thank you so much to everyone who's joined and again to um, uh, Reggie Blanding and Christina Strasberger in the AFAM department. And who else did I miss? And Naomi, thank you for-, for and, and you as well. <laughs> conversation, so yes. All right. All right, with that, I think, I think we've come to the end of time here. Thank you all so much for joining us. Stay safe and please check our website, fm.rutgers.edu for more events in the future. Take care. Good night.